Um, so in this QA session, um, uh, basically you can ask any questions you have about the identification toolbox, but of course you can all also ask them in the channel later on or on the next QA session this afternoon or this evening or this morning, whatever time zone you are in. So are there any questions about um, the toolbox you, I might help you out with? Yes, there I have some questions. Uh, can you please re-explain to us the interpretation of the identification strength in page 76, please? And uh, you explain you explain it in the video, but uh, I would like it. Uh, to, uh, I would like you please to explain it to us again, in order for us to understand how to interpret it, please. Uh, the graph, you mean? Yes, the graph. I think we can run this. So this graph. Yes, yes, please. Okay. So basically you have this, these two graphs and when you interpret this graph, you start at the lower panel first. Okay, so this graph keeps all values fixed and then it goes for each individual parameter, it's measuring the curvature of the likelihood. So in a sense, this tells you whether this parameter does have a, any effect on the curvature of the likelihood. Okay, keeping all other parameters fixed. And we have seen in, in the video that this RA, which is only uh, there for the calibration of beta, it does not enter any dynamics of the model. Okay, so it does not, so the, the likelihood is actually flat for this parameter. For theta and kappa, we know that there is a linear combination of those two that um, of basically offset each other. But if you fix one, then of course there is curvature to, to each of these parameters. Okay, so this is why you, you have these two graphs, that they are non-zero. If they are zero, then there is no sensitivity. The, the curvature is not, um, um, it's not dependent on this parameter at all. The likelihood is basically flat. And uh, there are two bars here. This is uh, dependent on how we normalize um, this sensitivity measure. If we just multiply with the parameter value or if we multiply with the prior standard deviation. Okay, so sometimes, because sometimes this um, multiplying by zero, if the parameter is zero, then this will not work. Now the upper part is actually um, the identification strength. Okay, so in a sense, if uh, you have non-zero bars, then uh, your parameters are uh, strongly identified. And the higher the bar, the more, um, the more strength uh, is, uh, you have uh, for identifying this parameter. Again, there are two bars dependent on the normalization we do. Um, now, he here you can actually see that theta and kappa, because we know theoretically they offset each other, that there is no strength. If you have a model where you want to estimate or check identification of both parameters, there is no strength because they offset each other. And this measure is basically co computed on the idea that um, um, that you, you have, uh, if a parameter does not enter the uh, likelihood at all, so down here, right, um, then this will be zero, or parameters can exactly offset each other. And this is exactly the case of theta and kappa in this, in this case. Okay, so but for, from an applied point of view, so you, you start out here, okay, and if you have something like that, then this, this already tells you, okay, something, I have like a very obvious identification failure here. Okay, I need to recheck my mode file. What is RA? Does it enter the model equation? Does it enter um, or does it influence other parameters, but not the dynamics at all? Okay, so you, can, you should then a, be able to fix this. If you see something, something like this, like there is no identification strength for theta and kappa for those two parameters, but individually they do enter, then this is a clear sign that there is some collinearity happening. 
Okay, and if everything, if you fixed everything, then you can have a look basically at these graphs and see, okay, um, so those parameters seem to be strongly identified compared maybe to, to rho, but it depends a bit on the normalization. So most likely you will be fine. Okay, if you have like, I don't know, 20 parameters and all are very strong, those bars are very strong, uh, but for some parameters, they're, they're very, very low, then this means they're probably like uh, weakly identified. This is the interpretation of that graph. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. I understand it now. Thank you very much. Any more questions? If there is no question, I have another question, please. If yeah, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. It is also an interpretation in uh, page 85. Can you uh, re-explain to us? I know you have explained it in the in the video because I watched the video. Can you explain it again the, the option in uh, the page 85 in the slide? Page yes, 85, page. the um, advanced option or which option are you referring to? When you run the model, when you run investment address, I don't advanced. Yeah. When you run this mod file, the, uh, there is a graph that pop up. Can you explain those graph to us, please? I can do that, yes. Um, the advanced, that's this one, right? Yes, I think it's this one. So are you referring to the singular values graphs or the collinear yes, the, the collinearity patterns? Yes, these two, the collinearity pattern and the singularity graph, please. Okay. So by default, you get two of these collinearity patterns. Okay. And this is basically running a regression of the columns in the Jacobian. Okay. So you have a, a matrix and you... Uh, do a simple regression, say you take the, um, the column of uh, theta and you regress it on the column of kappa up here. Okay, so this is basically your, in the regression sense, this is your y variable and up here are your x variables. Okay, so this is your endo endogenous and this is then your, your exogenous. Okay, so you're regressing the column of theta in the moments Jacobian on the column of kappa. And then you're simply computing uh, multi-correlation coefficients, the R squared in a sense. And if this is really dark red, that this means that this parameter can be perfectly replicated by this parameter. Okay, and you do this with one parameter or you can do this with two parameters, okay? So for instance, here you can, uh, or let's have a look at delta, okay? Um, how good or how, yeah, how good can you replicate um, the effect of delta on the moments by alpha and by theta, okay? And if you really get those really dark heat, this is a heat map, this dark, real red dark, then you have a problem. Okay, so you really have to look out for those red dark. This is not really bad, okay? And actually we plot uh, or we, we tell you the exact values in the console here. Okay, so I was looking at delta, right? So regressing the column of delta on the column of alpha and theta gives you a multi-correlation coefficient of 0 0.98. Um, if you have a really high number, say 0 0.99999, then this is really indicating that those two are almost perfectly collinear. If you have a number such this, um, this, this will probably tell you there is some, some, something going on in your model. There's just at least some weak identification of delta. But if you have a look which parameter influences this, it is again theta. Okay, theta and kappa mess up this whole model. And if you, for instance, uh, fix, let's just do this. Um, 
see what happens. Uh, let's fix, for instance, theta or kappa. It doesn't really matter. Let's re. Oh, <laughs> my bad. I have to uncomment it in the estimated params block, not in the parameters block, of course. Okay, so I'm not checking identification of theta. It is fixed at the calibrated values. Let's have a look at. Okay, you still get. You still get that, for instance, this delta parameter. There might be some weak identification of delta here. Okay, this is due to the fact that the uh, alpha and kappa. There's some, some offsetting, but this is totally fine. Okay, this is totally fine. Um, yes, so alpha, delta, and kappa might be not so well identified. They are theoretically identified. That's very important. They're theoretically, there's no problem, but there's weak identification maybe happening here. But having a look at this graphs, um, no, this is the sensitivity bar graph. Um, the other one, where is it? Oh, yeah, like the identification strength graph here now, this looks okay. Okay, so the the, the strength component is uh, according to this um, to this guy here is is okay. So if you like in practice, this graph is very important. If you find that there are some issues, then you look into those advanced option in the identification patterns, um, and then you you see that. Uh, um, parameters may, may be uh, correlated to each other, or the effect of parameters on the moments might all be offset by other parameters. But that's, I mean, that is okay in this model. Okay, thank you very much, I understand, thank you. Yes, and uh, the singular value, um, oh, no, that is without, let me, Simply close all the graphs and let me do redo this with this theta and kappa. Oh, maybe one more thing. Um, there is also an option if you not only want to do the regression on two parameters, but also on three, four, or five, there is an option to the identification to toolbox. It's uh, max dim covar group, I think. And then you simply put in a number equals to four, and then you get uh, four of those graphs. Okay, okay. Thank okay. you very much. Yes. And for the singular value, um, here the idea is if you have a singular matrix, a singular information matrix, you um, uh, have, or you have a look into the eigenvalues there. Or, uh, the eigenvectors, I'm sorry, the eigenvectors. And you can do this either for the smallest singular values or for the largest singular values. And the smallest ones are more interesting because a very small or almost zero singular value means that um, the parameters corresponding to the, to the eigenvectors here will, are most um, likely to be collinear. Or if you have a singular value of exactly zero, they are perfectly collinear, um, then they are just redundant, okay? And here you can see like this is 10 to the power of minus 40. This is basically zero, okay? And this parameter belonging to this bar is RA. You can see all the parameter names below. Now the next very low singular value, 10 to the power of minus 11, those two belong to theta and kappa. And then you get singular values of 300, 800. Those are fine. Those are not very small. Okay, so here in those graphs, really focus on the lowest one, those that are almost zero. And then you have an indication, okay, something is wrong with RA, something is wrong with theta and kappa. Because those parameters are responsible for singularity of my information matrix. So the rank of the information matrix is not four. Okay, thank you very much. I understand it. Thank you very much. And the other graph simply plots the three um, highest singular values for comparison. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much. Sure. Any more questions?
Hi. Um, I, yes. Not related directly to Bitcoin, but um, I want to get something clear. If I'm running identification uh, 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 toolbox compared to the sensitivity toolbox, is, um, are they necessary in the same work or are they kind of complementary or alternative? Um, they are complementary. Okay, so the insight you get from the sensitivity toolbox is very important also from an identification point of view. Um, for instance, in the, uh, using the sensitivity toolbox, you get a feeling for which parameters are most important for which moments of which impulse response functions of which variables. And this is, of course, for identification, very important. If you, if you find that um, say a, a parameter is very important for the um, moments of uh, your output or your um, yes or your your interest rate, then you can then uh, use this information to to recheck the identification here, see whether this is also uh, this has also an effect on the strength of identification. It most likely will. So they are very complementary. Um, actually, in the sensitivity toolbox, there's an option to call identification, to do some parts of the identification toolbox in the sensitivity toolbox. And in the chat, there are a, there's a question um, regarding the parameter estimation using the steady state file based on uh, Ghani. Maybe uh, just write me a, a, per, say a personal message on, on Mattermost, and then we can talk about that. Um, I have talked about estimated parameters. Can this also be done on a calibrated model? So uh, what, what do you mean exactly with this? Um, are you a bit confused about this, this, why I'm using estimated params here? Nijiri, please feel free to, to speak up. Yes, because now it gives me a feeling like um, this identification toolbox um, it's, it's like a test that you run if your model is, is estimated. But you find in some cases you work with the uh, uh, calibrated parameters, like you ha it's not estimated model yet. So can mm -hmm. we still do this kind of identification? If I want to know the parameters that are driving my model and the model is calibrated, it's not an estimation. Yeah, um, totally. This is not really about estimation here. Um, I'm not using any data, right? I have never in, in the whole uh, talk and you don't see any data file here. This is really a theoretical property of your model. Okay, and okay. maybe this, this might be a bit confusing for you that we're using estimated params. This is just yeah. the, the Dynair block that we reuse to select those parameters that we want to focus on. Question still is why would you want to do that? So why would you be interested in whether some observables are informative for parameters in the model if you don't really want to estimate them? Because if you pick your parameters, if the model is calibrated, you don't care about identification properties usually. Mm. Well, uh, my my typical example for for this is I can um, like in the in the exercise you have this N and Schorfheide model with this uh, monetary policy rule, and I can actually give you two calibrations that are very very different in um, in terms of economic uh, of your the economic underlying model. So one calibration is a very hawkish monetary policy rule. And the other one is a very dwarfish monetary policy rule, and they will give you the exact same moments, exact same impulse response functions. And this is just calibration without estimating you anything. And this is a problem if you then go to your central bank and say, hey, central bank, you need to be very dwarfish because then the impulse response function will look like this. And then uh, another, uh, another day you come to again to the central bank and say, hey, no, please be dwarfish because the impulse response function will be exactly again like this. This is not going to work. So this is also a very important exercise for calibration. Or in the video, I talked about this investment adjustment costs. You have a model 
you want a model basically with two types of investment adjustment costs, but then you switch off one and there's a calibration that will give you the exact same moments as if you switch the other one or if you have both. So there are basically three different calibrations that will give you the exact same dynamics. And it's not good. It depends. So you might say, I don't care. As long as you pick the parameters in, in a consistent way, we don't really care whether they give the same dynamics. What you have in mind, I guess, is kind of a sensitivity analysis. So you're still varying the parameters. Fair enough. In that case, you need to know whether changing the parameters affects anything within your model. But if you take this from a strict calibration perspective, those are my parameter values. That's just the way they are. Let's say you have micro evidence or whatever then you would never vary them. And then you would not be interested in how does a particular parameter drive the model solution potential. So it's a bit. No, but still the, the, those parameters are not unique. If you tell me I calibrated this parameter based on whatever I want to achieve and it's not unique, um, then this is not, not good. No, it's not unique from the perspective of your model, but strictly speaking, exactly. calibration yeah. would be you have micro data that tells you something about a particular parameter, then that's the unique value. Even if within your model, if you would try to estimate it, it would be non-unique because the thing here is that you have outside evidence on the value of the parameter. Of course, if you use your model for finding the parameter, then you're right. But there are cases where that is not the exercise you have in mind. Okay, but if you still think about how to calibrate your model, even if you later on want to work with a calibrated model, then you're right. But then again, it's about picking the exact parameter values. And then you want to know what's going on. But then we could debate whether that's identification or sensitivity you're caring yes. about. Yeah, yeah. But then we, we can go back to the question sensitivity and identification are very related yeah. um, concepts. Yes. Um, so, uh, just uh, a follow-up question on that. So if, if, if my model is calibrated and I run this identification toolbox, if, if there is something um, weird about any of, the, any of the parameters, then what is the cure? Sorry, I didn't get the last part of your question. I'm saying if my model is calibrated and I realize out, uh, after running this test, there is something strange about uh, one parameter, uh, then how do I cure this in my model? Is it by changing the value of the parameter or like Johannes uh, has put it, I just take it as, 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 a, fixed, as a fixed parameter depending on uh, oh, the, the theoretical information I, I have. It depends on the type of problem. So if there is just a local identification issue, something that happens at the prior mean of the smets Walters model, then changing the parameter would actually work. But usually if you have that type of issue, I guess you have already seen that in the examples. If there is something really fundamental, that usually means changing the model because this is not, this is usually a model property. And then, yeah, you might, have to think about, for example, how to modify the Taylor rule, the monetary policy rule, as opposed to just simply changing a parameter base. Oh, yes. please let me, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Please let me ask you a question. Um, yesterday, when we're having FIFA um, um, class, uh, Juanes class, we, we talked about those parameters that are functions of another parameter. So for example, we talk about the kappa in the, uh, what they call it, um, uh, the, the Phillips curve. Uh, new, yeah, new Kinsha Phillips curve, which is a function of the, uh, the discount factor as well as the, uh, the slope of the uh, IS. So the, the question I have here is this, uh, assuming you want to test the sensitivity itself, would you suggest that the, uh, we test the sensitivity of kappa or of the other of the other parameter that are, that it is a function of? 
um, here is again the, the okay, maybe here's the, the question, what, what do you want to do? Do you want to estimate the model? Like Johannes was telling you yesterday, then mm -hmm. you really need to take care of this problem because the optimizer won't know this, this relationship. Okay. If you do a calibration exercise where you, you, you just need a value for the slope of the new Keynesian Phillips curve, um, because you are concerned about, uh, I don't know, about optimal monetary policy or something like that, and you need a value for the monetary policy. But again, only if so, that is independent. So you can have model formulations where this is kind of independent because this kappa is essentially a proxy for theta, the Kaibo parameter, yeah. because the beta is going to appear somewhere else, then that's fine. But if those parameters appear somewhere else, then even identification or sensitivity analysis will be wrong if you just change kappa without taking into account how it, how it will affect the other parameters. So, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's, it is, like Johannes was saying, I guess, yesterday, and uh, I want to say this again, and Marco will probably also tell you, it is very important to, to know your model, to know the underlyings, um, and to, to be aware of those issues. And this identification toolbox is a tool that uh, you can use to find these. Like for this investment adjustment costs, where I have a parameter that simply sets the value of my uh, discount factor. And if you, um, and this the toolbox tells you, hey, there's something, uh, have a look at this. And if you say, hey, that's fine. I don't really care about this parameter, just that it sets the discount factor, that's fine. Okay, this is just a tool. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? Yes, I have a question again, please. Sorry for asking a lot of no, questions. No, that's great. Today. That's great. That's great. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you? Uh, I know I watch in the video and the slide. Uh, you explained how to do. Uh, about sense, uh, about identif identification for nonlinear models. I don't know if you have an example of it and if you can share it with us and show us how to do it with a nonlinear model, please. First, explain or re-explain it to again, please, mm -hmm. as you did in the video. And if you have an example to show us, it will help us a lot, please. Um, I mean, the example, uh... Uh, didn't I also have this in the video that this investment adjustment cost example that I used throughout the video, this theta and kappa problem is actually something that only happens if you solve the model with order equals one, that is if you log linearize your model or you linearize your model. So this is only then the case. A quick, quick follow-up question. When you say nonlinear model, you mean a model entered nonlinear in a model block and then solved at order one? Or do you really mean identification at higher order? So or setting order one or two or something like that? Yes, as uh, I hear, I think because uh, I saw one day in the dinner forum, uh, Professor Johannes saying that if you, if you want, if you write a DSG model, it is better to write it without log linearizing. So if you have it in a, in a non-log linearized form in the model block, and uh, you want to use the identification for that. Is it possible? I'm, I'm talking about this one, not about the pruning when you have, uh, yes. Okay, um, so if you log linearize your model by hand, okay, mm -hmm. and you put those equations into Dynair, you can't do any order equals two or order equals three. This is uh, the only thing you can do is order equals one. Okay, so the, there's, since you've done the log linearization, all Dynair does for you is simply find finding the solution to the rational expectations um, problem, to the rational expectations problem. Um, if you enter the nonlinear equations, um, like in the exercise of uh, Michel's uh, part, right, where you have this N and Shaw fighter model in those three different representations. One was the nonlinear equations, and the other one was the log linearized one. So if you focus really on the nonlinear equations, you put this in, in the mode file, and then you do, for instance, identification or Stoxemo uh, equals order of order equals one, then this will be get, is the same as if you have put the log linearized equations. This is exactly the same. Okay, but if you include the no, the nonlinear model equations, you can actually then also do order equals two, order equals three. This is possible. 
and that's that's one maybe one reason why it is uh, useful to to really work with those nonlinear model equations. Okay, and for the identification toolbox, if you want to check identification of a nonlinearly solved model, then you need to enter those nonlinear model equations. I guess the question is, does it make a difference whether the model is entered linearly or nonlinearly if you want to do it at order one? And the answer is conceptually no, because in the background, the layer will linearize. So you don't gain anything by linearizing by hand. And nothing, in, nothing would change except for the model equation and the model block. Everything else is still exactly the same. But the advantage, I, I would say, from uh, a debugging perspective is if you don't linearize by hand, there is less risk of introducing mistakes because a lot, of, a lot of times the parameters will actually affect the steady states. And those steady states, in turn, will become parameters of the model if you linearize. So when you enter your model nonlinearly, usually all the cross-equation restrictions that identification would check will be preserved in the nonlinear model, while in the linearized one, if you do a mistake, then you're screwed. OK, thank you very much, both professors. Thank you very much, all. Thank you very much. I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you all. OK. Any more questions? All right. I have just noticed that I forgot uh, to put the emote file for the exercise uh, on the wiki. I've done so just uh, an hour ago. So um, I think I will go through the solutions to the exercise this uh, in the next QA session. It will be recorded, so you can have a look there as well. Uh, but just to give you some time to have a look at the exercise itself. Okay, there's, this is the exercise is about the N and Schorfheide model in its nonlinear model with its model nonlinear model equations, then running the identification toolbox on different variants of the model. Um, so for you, this is more or less just uh, playing around with the identification command. Okay. Um, 